Happy Monday, everybody. We were just talking about the last dance before we turned the live stream on. Uh, so you totally finished it, right, Andrew? Yeah, I finished it all, yeah. Um, I still, I think I'm maybe halfway through it at this point. Mm -hmm. um, not because it's bad or anything, but um, other stuff has kept popping by, kept popping in. And, yeah, uh, I, I made a decision to like, just sort of like, you know, just spend the weekend and make my way through the whole thing. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad I did. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, like I said, it's, as a documentary, it's really well done, really well presented, you know, as a sports documentary, kind of, you know, going through a period of time that like, I was aware of, but was it really? You didn't get the scale of it. I mean, you could see this, like I, I, I can make my tweet, like I, I owned a pair of Air Jordans. Like I didn't, I, I didn't do team sports after I was 10, you know, I just did martial arts. And so like, but even for me to go have to feel that, oh, I got to get a pair of these Air Jordans, like that's like, you know, I wasn't exactly known for following peer pressure trends. Yeah. Um, uh, but you know, the, the bulls, 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 but like, yeah, just, it was just like, it was around you, but just sort of like, nah, it's not my thing, but it was really, mm. you know. Yeah. Um, um, let me see. Justin, you're not connected yet, are you? I am connected can now. You, can you do me a favor? Disconnect. Uh, we were in, in talking with, uh, some of the people about the thing the other day. Yeah. Um, uh, they suggested that that version of Chrome is not considered supported. Would you mind connecting with, uh, just via Firefox or another browser? You got for it. Today? You got it. And we'll yeah. see if that happens or not again. Um, but yeah, and it, it's also, it's, a, it's really well made. And I think there's a certain like timelessness to it now, mm -hmm. part, partly because this is like its second wave via, via Netflix. So it's not like yeah. everyone is hammering about it, you know, every week anymore. Um, yeah. And so you can just you can get back to it. I, you know. Yeah. Johnny right. come lately is like ourselves can be like, oh, well, let's check out go. this sports ball documentary. Yeah. Hey, Brian. Okay. And we are live. Uh, and your button's on. Let's see. Hello, everybody. We'll get started with weird things here in just a few minutes. We're getting everyone connected and collected and co correct. All right. Hey, How does that sound? Good? That sounds good. Perfect. Thank you very Perfect. much. Hey, everybody. How was your weekends? It was good. Uh, man, uh, uh, Shit's Creek really, really cleaned up the Emmys. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, good for that show. It was, uh, it was, you know, kind of the little uh, the little program that could going from like co-financed uh, with like the CBC and pop, <laughs> you know, the former <laughs> TV guide channel. Uh, did I see right? I saw that the um, the mom won an Emmy, the dad won an Emmy. Did the son th win an Emmy? Dude, that's awesome. Oh. Oh, actually, you want you want to know what? Huh. Bryce, can you talk right now? Well, he's setting stuff up. Oh, is he setting stuff up? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hey, what's up? Oh, you just. Oh, never mind. Okay, oh, I am hearing. Yeah, it. there was. Yeah. If you heard an echo, it's because I turned the studio on so I could hear you. Guys. No, 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 no. I was just. I didn't know whether or not I was getting everything. All right, because yeah, never mind. We good. Yeah, they uh they swept. I think this is the first time. Where a show, a show's cast swept all four leading uh, uh, acting roles. Uh, Definitely well deserved. Yeah. Man, if Mash never did it, jeez. <laughs> uh, are you guys watching Lovecraft Country? I am. Yeah. Did you see last night's? I did. Yeah. Kind of blew my mind. Like. Oh, this is what this can be. Uh, far and away, the best of the series. Uh, oh, I, I didn't. I don't know if I'd go that far. Uh, I, I actually would have preferred it to kind of tie a little bit more into the, the central thing. But I thought it was good for what it was. I didn't. I didn't have a. I didn't have a problem with it per se. Yeah, I think I liked it more because it didn't tie in, and uh, 
uh, I mean, like I almost would advise somebody who, if you wanted to give the show a try, just start with episode six and then, then go back to the beginning. Uh... Yeah, I don't. Yeah, that that would be that would be a bold that'd be a bold strategy, because also I think I'm getting Andrew's uh, volume twice. Um, let's see. He Did that not. mute him in Skype for you? He might not have the mutes. You're getting. You're, are you still getting him twice? Uh, well, yeah. Let's let's see when he talks. Andrew, could you talk for us? Andrew, could you uh, talk for us? Oh, hi. My name is Andrew, and I am speaking out of my mouth right now. All right. Yeah. Talking. Maybe it's maybe it's it sounds fine now. Okay. What are you hearing? I I thought I was hearing you twice, but uh, it, it doesn't sound like it's happening oh, okay. anymore. There is more static on the line than normal, or is that just somebody's AC? If it is um, AC, then I'll shut up because. Yeah, uh, Justin, can I have you G give me a minute here? I'm gonna take a look into some settings because I want to see if uh, switching. I am. I am getting. I am getting something a little bit. You're getting something weird. Well, yeah. No, I'm. It just. It looks like my. Yeah, you sound like you're coming in real noisy. Yeah, and this is this is via Firefox. I hear it now. Okay, yeah. Oh, I no, so I, 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 I just pulled my How is your how is your gain? Is your gain really low? That's see, that's not even I'm I'm muting my entire channel and it's still giving a baseline hum. Oh yeah. Hmm. Ain't no gain, sucker. Let me uh let me let me try on other chrome. Okay. We'll turn the gate back on. And see. What just happened there? Uh, we uh, have, we gated him. Um, so it'll clip out all that extra room noise when he's not t when he's not speaking. Um, um, and to the chat room, no, I did not watch uh, the Challenger Final Flight. Um, <laughs> I saw that it was not to laugh at that, but I saw like produced by Bad Robot. I'm like. Yo. Interesting play. <laughs> the, the twist is it suddenly uh, shifts to the fact that the, the horrifying fact that they were alive for the two minute fall. <laughs> well, there is that. All right. Well, the, 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 the background hum is, is very significantly reduced juice. Can, yeah. Can you talk for me a little bit? Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Justin Robert Young, talking to you. What's going on? Okay. Well, uh, we can live with that today. We'll uh, keep an eye out for the auto gain stuff. And uh, I'll see if I can look into a little bit where that might be in Windows, in, just in case that's anything. Yeah, that is super weird because it, like I muted it and then all of a sudden it like way up to my eh, whatever. We'll, we'll do what we can with it now, but I don't know what I don't know what's going on. My my my, my gain is now totally like redlined uh yeah. on on the board. So mm. yeah, it does seem like it's still it's still something there. Um, can we try one thing? At least it's changing when I mute now. Like it actually does like, shut, shut it off. Like dumb question. Opal's not like picking up like another channel or something or something different or I don't know. Um, that would be a good question for Justin's side because we can't yes. control what Input. No, no, this is at Justin for the reference. No, this is okay. this is uh, yeah. Here, I'll... yeah, okay. That was a that's a good clean mute. That's everything. It's uh, connecting to the board, which is uh, a USB input. Okay. Mm. 
So I always get nostalgic and uh, and misty whenever it uh, is the first day of of not the surface of Venus, uh, and that's today. And so I just want to say I love you guys. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Here, Justin, can we try one last thing for me? If you sure. can uh, yeah. right click on the little volume icon at the bottom and open sound settings. And then on the right side, you'll see related settings, sound control panel. Can you click that for me? Uh, open sound settings. And sorry, what was the next thing? Uh, on the right, on the sidebar on the right, you should see sound control panel. Under related settings on the on the right side above. It's yeah, I'm not seeing oh here I have app and volume device preferences. App and volume. No no no, I'm sorry, on the right side panel, like um Yeah, not, there's nothing here on the You may have to if the screen is not big enough, it may shrink it may not show you that. So maybe you might need to widen that window just a touch. Possibly. All right. So I'm going into open sound settings, right? Mm -hmm. All right. I have that. And then on the right, oh, wait, sound control panel. Yeah, sound control panel. All right. There we go. I got it. And then go to the yes. recording tab for me. Okay. And find what your um, mixer would be. Okay. Yep. And click on properties for me. Okay. Um, let's do a few things on the do you have an enhancements tab enhancements i got listen levels and advanced along with general in the tabs mm, interesting and then i have properties um let's check um advanced first off okay uh where it says exclusive mode are those checked yes uh, uncheck that top one, and it should uncheck the bottom one for me. Try that. Okay. Okay. And now go over Apply. to... Uh, hmm. Okay. Well, I don't know that that's... Okay. Uh, well, we'll we'll try that. Uh, I thought there had... Because on ours, and it might be because it's a USB thing that we have an enhancements tab. So, um, okay. Hit OK for me, and then you can OK out of the control panel. For our new listeners, this is a show called Podcast Talk. It's like car talk, but for like working on podcast settings. Uh, should I disconnect and reconnect? Um, yeah, let's try that. With uh, uh, roughly an equivalent amount of us making sound effect noises. Yeah. Do they make a lot of car noises on car talk? Is that sarcasm? Or? I, yeah. don't, I don't know the that's, program. It's that's, kind of like literally yeah. their whole bit is people call in and they're like, I got a problem with the car. And they're like, well, what does it sound like? And so people are constantly going like, it goes, squeak, squeak. And, and, and they all laugh because they got people to make <laughs> noises on NPR. <laughs> all right. That's very dumb. Okay. Insanely popular show. <laughs> yeah no it was it was like uh in fact uh they had a cameo in cars uh oh really yeah they were the employers of um uh uh the the sponsors rusty's the the two brothers yeah oh okay they were the titular cars in cars yeah uh, one of them has passed away since and so the show's not on anymore but they are not iron cars anymore no um okay well i think we can live with that today cars. and uh Thank you very much, Justin, for indulging me a little bit. No prob. All right. Um, how's everybody doing? You guys ready to start weird things? Let's Yay. do it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, then. Uh, let me click a few buttons here. Da, 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 da. Okay. All right, Andrew, I'm going to count you in, and we can start weird things here in three, two, one. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hey man, uh, did you defect? Did you get a haircut? Mm, I think we talked about it last week. Never mind. Okay. Cut my own hair. Like a maverick. <laughs> uh, Justin Robert Young. 
Uh, hey, friends, I did get a haircut and I paid good money for it. And I don't care who knows it. Yes. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hey, everybody. That's me. I still have not cut my hair. Well, Bryce, if you need some tips, just let me know. We'll live stream it. <laughs> if you need some tips, I have them. I saved them over here. I can yeah. send them to you. Yeah. Those classic hair uh, tips. That'd be, that'd be funny. Like, oh, my God. One of us blindfolded while the other one's watching on video, and we're trying to cut ourselves while the other person tells us what to do. Uh, <laughs> no, you're left. No, you're left. No, you're left. <laughs> it's a you know, keep cutting and nobody will laugh. <laughs> we promise. <laughs> oh, geez. This is what things have resorted us to. Hey, so uh, last week, Facebook had their Facebook, which used to be called Oculus Connect. Now it's like Facebook Connect, but it's still Oculus, which was where they did their presentation reveal of the brand new Oculus Quest 2 and showed some of the new initiatives that Facebook's working on. And uh, I don't know if you've read the reviews for the hardware for Oculus Quest 2, uh, you know, raves, you know, the Quest 2, they've dropped the price, the introductory price from $399 down to $299. They're using the latest Qualcomm Snapdragon processor, which means that it's way faster than the original. It's got 50% more pixels, which they're saying is effectively 2K per eye. And uh, they did use a cloth strap, uh, which some people say, uh, most people say it's it's sort of a downgrade, but for 50 bucks more, you can buy a the, the Elite strap, so you can still get the brand new Quest with a much more pro level strap for still 50 bucks cheaper than the original Quest. Of course, you have to have a Facebook account. Yeah, that's which weird, I mean, weirdly... even even if you don't use it, you probably have it. it it's just a matter of like, you know, like realizing, oh, no, this is going to be a thing forever, isn't it? And that I'm always just going to have to be tied to this thing. Yeah. So it's for some people, that's the deal breaker. And and it's one of these things where you see these reviews of like, because I, I, from a hardware point of view, what you're getting for two hundred ninety nine dollars is amazing. And and I've heard, you know, people like, ah, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm like, I'm with you. Tell me the other headset. It's totally wireless in this level I should get. <laughs> I'll pay a couple hundred bucks more, but there isn't. There isn't. There's just nothing out there. Yeah. No. Cer certainly no, there's for not. right now. But but of course, it, it, it's it's also, I mean, I, I think all three of us would agree that it's inevitable that somebody steps into the space and joins the club. But you're right. For right now, they're the only player in, time, in town. Yeah, there will be. It's just between, you know, the fun I could be having now. Yeah. You know, um, I love my quest. I love, love, love being untethered. I love the quest. I love not having to worry about cables or anything. I love the fact that self-contained. I love the fact that, you know, I've got multiple that if I want to use one, my girlfriend can use hers, you know, that I just, that is a, one of the things I just like is that it's not like you have to have, you know, in a house, you have to have more than one PC to be able to drive them. Um, it's just part of the fun is you can have, you know, multiple in the house. The 299 price point is insane. I mean, the original oh, quest, yeah. when I got that, I thought what they put into it's great. I, I, I think uh, I think uh, Justin and I bought in on the Vive when it was eight ninety nine and required a, a full PC to run it. Um, yeah. 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 So so I mean, two ninety nine for a self-contained unit really is truly remarkable. I mean, think about like uh, with that with that five hundred dollars of savings, you could buy. Let me check my math. Yes. All of the good VR games, all of them. Yep. You can buy all of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, and what they've done now, too, is that we talked about this was coming up last week because the, the question was the specs on the Quest 2 seem too good to be true because it meant like, well, what's going to happen to the Rift S? Because that's their, their tethered Oculus, you know, one plugging into your PC. And if the Quest was this good, like, why would anybody buy that? And the answer is Facebook says nobody will. That's why we're going to discontinue it in a few months. And going forward, it's going to be the Quest 2. Then if you want to do PC games, plug into Steam or whatever else, you then just use your cable to your PC. And, and so, then you so can then, run it. Then it offloads. Uh, uh, so so yeah, uh, I didn't know that you could. I, I know we had talked about it plugging into the PC, but I didn't know that it would play nice with, with S Steam specifically. Well, there are other, I, you know, I got to look to see, but there are... Uh, you know, there are many different ways to make it work. Yeah. Um, so, with, with, uh, with the, well, I, like I do know that um, uh, Facebook has been spending a lot of money to 
pay people to make certain properties exclusive to Oculus at the expense of of, of the of the, uh, the Vive. Um, uh, so so, but but if they're now in a dominant position and they're willing to play nice with Steam, then that that might be worth uh, me reconsidering uh, getting one of these. Well, now, I you mean, may I think still the, big, the biggest the thing is that three hundred, right? The biggest thing is is two ninety nine, and and you need to be two hundred ninety nine dollars worth of sure to be in the the like uh, VR game, and that's the thing is you already have you had a lot of space over there that you've already dedicated to VR. Uh, so at a certain point, does that just make sense to to have the ability to to uh, interact with it? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, as far as like, there's been the ability to play, you know, both, you know, with Steam using Oculus Rift and Quest has been there for a while. So, you know, that's going to see, you know, I don't, I don't know how tightly that integration works, but, um, you know, looks, you know, you can plug right into Steam VR. Yeah. So. I, it sounds like the only thing that this wouldn't offer then is the Valve Index does have the, the Knuckles interface where you get individual, um, uh, although, although I wonder, I wonder if this has it just without even, well, you, uh, no, I guess if you're holding a control. No, I don't think you don't get individual fingers yeah. on that, but. Um, boy, I, and, and, and by the way, uh, this is not a complaint. This is us being spoiled for choice. This is, this is us. Yeah. This yeah. is in every way the best set of problems. Like, well, you know, what the quest ago. has, which is great as hand tracking. Right, right. Uh, 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 yeah. But 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 that's just naked hands, right? So yeah, uh, bare naked hands, right? Bare <laughs> naked hands. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's going to be like Stratus, but I think from a hardware point of view, like Facebook has just thrown so much money and so much effort into this. That uh, and now the idea of like, nah, yeah, get the Quest, get the cable, plug it into your PC, play PC games. It's kind of like they there was uh there was talk last year because when they announced the quest you could you internally at facebook you got the impression there was one camp that was like pc gaming's the future because you'll never have the same experience on a mobile and the other people were like yes but mobile can go mass market we can get more more mobile devices into people's hands and you knew somebody won an argument the day you went to go to oculus and it defaulted to the quest because they were always out of stock. They couldn't just this demand for outstrip whatever they thought the supply was going to be. And then now going forward, they're like, yeah, and for the foreseeable future, if you want to have a PC experience, just buy the Quest and plug it in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is a smart move on their part. Um, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll be really interested to see, um, I, I, I guess, you know, this is future, future forwarding. Um, uh, it, it sounds like they're obviously the... Uh, the dominant player here and will continue to be so. I wonder if they're going to try to emulate any kind of finger articulation, but but it sounds to me like they're they're just gonna rely on the the naked hands I, part. I, I think I think that it's just it's you're going to see a style of game that will continue to take advantage of what that hardware does best. It's like, yeah, you're right, Brian. You might not see that gauntlet style like a finger articulation, but you're probably going to see games that have an, a, a move advantage, a physical mobility advantage that like just, really just is run around, run around and your annoying. house and you're never going exactly. to exactly like, it'll just replace every bit of your furniture and detritus on the floor with, you know, uh, uh, goblin stones or whatever. And, and so you'll know to not trip over them. Yeah. Now, have uh, you used this finger tracking Brian on the no I, I tried to buy a valve index but they um they were uh sold out when when I this is right after lockdown but basically what it is is you just have a strap so that you can fully open your hands and the controller still stays in your hand and then it pays attention to each of your fingers so um uh do you think that's a killer feature for VR um uh, I, I I think I really missed it when I was playing half-life Alex and I think it would have been a lot mm, a, a little more immersive for for me to be able to you know to to, to <laughs> forgive me give middle fingers uh but but also to close three of my fingers and use um one of them as a pointer finger to press buttons and all that stuff so um um I, I, again i it's not a hill i want to die on or anything and and it's not a con there's such a temptation uh from grade school holdover where it's like i'm Genesis, I am Super Nintendo, um, and truthfully, uh, I, I think we're all on team both. But uh, uh, I, I, I do 
uh, I, I tend to see things uh, in how they contrast uh, as opposed to, you know. Yeah, you know what? Just saying, on the Quest, what it has, and it's not the same, but they have, there's a sensor on the front button which tells if your finger's just lightly, if it's near it. And so you do get for your finger thing, it's not the same as all the other fingers at all, but you still have like, because I know like we use the Quest, it's easy to do like the one t finger type. You just let go of the button or you bring your hip finger near. So there is some sensitivity there, but it's not all four fingers, you know, like the knuckles. Yeah. But, um, uh, but I, I never, it's not a thing I ever think about, you know, again, because it's just, you just, you spend enough time in that thing. And I think you just sort of, you know, it's like chopsticks. You just sort of get used to it. Yeah, and and that that is important to note. It's like, um, you know, you 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 don't miss what you don't have. You know, so it's like, uh, uh, you know, what you have with the quest is complete freedom to use it anywhere, uh, very very easily. And so you tend you tend to focus on that part. Yeah, and I you know I've been lucky to like try being in LA where you got a lot of VR stuff. I've tried a lot of experimental stuff and some like crazy stuff some of what i'm not under nda on <laughs> you know where um you know like entire like things you sit in that move you or give you motion simulation stuff and things like that um and it is crazy too because you see like there was a period of time where companies that you would never like entertainment come like they were involved in entertainment tech that were getting into like vr stuff that were trying stuff out um and i've seen a lot of you know the the only time i ever had a thing that made me go omg it's this or nothing was when I got to use the, the, the beta vive, you mm -hmm. know, back when that was first, you know, wait, 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 you, I remember you describing for us what it yeah. was like to paint with, with light waves in, uh, uh, I've, I've forgotten the name of the, the, uh, the painting. Program. Uh, yeah, that was, yeah. The, and now it's just sort of, uh, you know, a, a default, you know, program that you can get, you know, that's easy. And, but that was a thing. That was my first sense of you're know, using, using one of the first examples of six off six degrees of, of, you know, freedom and having that, you know, playing tilt brush in there and just remembering being in a space that felt real. Cause once you moved your head around, that was, that, that was what I was you know, like telling you guys like, Oh my God, yeah. this is amazing. <laughs> You know, the bartender, you know, when she steps up, you know, the Silicon Valley. Uh, but, you know, yeah. And that's the thing, like, we're, we're uh, you know, this is such, we're at a great point now, a great starting point. And the two ninety nine price point, I think, is fantastic. Yeah. It's and it, bold play. It, it, it also reduces that, um, that pain point of upgrading where it's just like, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. So they unveiled some other stuff, too. And one of the things they demonstrated was the concept of the infinite office. And one of the things that they do now with the Quest is you can have your home environment actually be your actual environment where you'll see in black and white your environment around you and then your interface, etc. And then the, the Quest infinite office, we're watching a video right now where we're a woman sitting at a table and she's using her hands to control a screen in front of her. She's scrolling through like some Web pages, looking at some stuff. She's getting a phone call or, or, you know, she's getting a uh, notification through the, you know, through their telling her something while her roommate's making a lot of noise. She's just like, all right, I'm going to the other room without makes a kind of an angry face. Now she's standing at a standing desk and she's looking at different screens and scrolling through stuff. And the background is her actual environment. But, you know, the cameras are black and white, so it's shown as black and white. This is the cool part. She's in VR and she's just pulled out a keyboard. And she's changed her environment to something more serene. And she's got ghost hands. Now she's typing on the keyboard, answering texts. Uh, on a physical so, keyboard? Physical yeah. keyboard. Okay. Yeah. So this is uh, this is their AR play, right? Sort of. I mean, she's not an AR right now. But what this is, is there's Logitech has a keyboard. They're partnering with Oculus on that when you pull it into your VR environment, you'll see the keyboard in your VR to be positioned in VR. And then when you just use your hands, whatever, you can see your hands where they are and you can type on the keyboard. Now she's so in VR. I, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess, uh, uh, and I understand that these uh, terms have, uh, you know, very specific definitions, but I guess this would be more, what, mixed reality? A the idea blended that, reality. Like, you, you yeah. have, is it blended reality, yeah. not augmented yeah, I reality? Guess uh, yeah, I mean, I guess the I think the, the thing I was trying to draw attention to is the fact the use of the physical keyboard in VR, the idea yeah. that she actually yeah. has a full keyboard in there in this office where she can pull up as many screens as she wants, 
and yeah. has you know presumably this sort of environment where all of a sudden she's you know pulling out a keyboard using a keyboard that exists virtually as well as physically yeah. Yeah, that's that's huge. That's I mean, uh, the idea that you can go one for one like that. Uh, I think there's, you know, I, I would be uh, it, in in a way, it almost kind of feels future focused on on like, you know, uh, oh, like I work in this great, amazing office and look at all these uh, amazing brass fixtures and then you take off your dirty laundry. Energy. I don't see any dirty laundry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I think for somebody that is, I mean, look, work from home has never been more of a big issue as it is right now. The idea of spicing it up in, in a way that could actually make you more productive and, and bringing your immersion to a productivity place is, that's a fascinating idea. Yeah. So, you know, we'll see where this is going to go towards the future, but you've seen companies now like Spatial. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but like they've got... Uh, they're doing these sort of meeting spaces and environments where you can like, hop in on your Oculus Quest and be there virtually. Somebody can be there on their phone, and uh, yeah, they've got the their, their avatars are a little scary because they're using like photo renders onto people, and they have these sort of weird hunched shoulders. But you know, we're watching people, you know, virtual ghost people interacting in 3D space. While some yeah. person's physically standing there, <laughs> I think uh, I, I, I don't. I don't. I don't know if I like this one as much as I like the other idea. Well, the well, other I, idea I, seems a little well, bit more doable, whereas like this, this very much seems like an idea dreamed up by people who liked Second Life. Uh, yes. Well, and uh, I, I actually think this can work, but but nobody will choose to look at, like the dead-eyed version of themselves. Everybody's gonna be uh dinosaurs and robots and and penguins and and abraham lincoln's and whatever or you I know mean, you look I, at I, the facebook avatars are pretty good yeah i mean i i can see that there is an idea of business avatar right because this is you know like all right you're you're meeting with your team and you've never met each other before so maybe this isn't the time to put on the velociraptor hat but uh, I, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, and maybe I'm being too, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 mean about this, but it's just more the, the, I think that there are ways that we like to connect right now. And like, if immersion is the point, uh, then even at the cost of like seeing another avatar that would collaborate, like that that avatar can just as easily be a floating window or text or or whatever well, uh, as opposed to interacting with a, a there a there's sprite. also a, a a fidelity problem in that there's still even in this demo that we're watching right now there's a certain amount of of herky jerky jitter to everything and it's like if i am interviewing somebody for a job or want to know how good of a host they'll be for my corporate retreat or whatever like i think i would still prefer just a straight up video shot of them because i would i would feel more like i'm seeing the real person than than the kind of uh, uh, you know i don't know uh, well, well yeah rep representation but like, throw out the pro and con though like uh i spent uh, like a week or so ago i had a buddy that was wanted to wanted to test something he built in um rec room and i spent an hour talking to him in rec room and we're both just casually sitting looking at our you know our little silly rec room avatars and it's adapted and it was better than a phone call it was better than a phone call you know and and the thing the advantage of like avatars is if you want to do some sort of video presence but like you don't want to worry if your hair is combed or put on pajamas and stuff or whatever you know, a lot of people it's stressful a lot of people video calls are actually stressful because uh they don't have low standards like we do <laughs> <laughs> no 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 I, I i do think that there is there's a room for virtualized avatars like that uh i i i guess i just maybe i fell in love with that initial idea of like oh no here is just when now you the, the archaic thing is what i'm looking at now with my three monitor array uh, mm -hmm. when I really think about like what I'm getting out of it. Like if what I need is an ability to connect a internet, uh, 
enabled thing where I can bring up browsers and, and use certain apps, then yeah, a lot of that can be done. A, that can all be done on my phone. So it, it can certainly be done in a heads up display that now I can free up space. I can now just have a standing desk and a couple nice chairs as opposed to an entire room of equipment. I want to get a little abstract thinking for a moment. And and one of my frustrations though with some VR experiences is like you watch these videos and you look at Horizon, the video for that, and it's you know, these wide open plazas and vistas and people going from here and fro and whatnot. And then other places where you create these big worlds and then all of a sudden you're down in the middle of it playing it and you're like, okay, uh, I got to use my thumbstick or I got to teleport or in some other fantasy, I'm on a treadmill going from yeah. point A to point B. And I wonder if we need to rethink how certain spaces work because, you know, is there something I, should we shrink these spaces? Should we make these spaces smaller? So you're not like spending so much time moving from point A to point B. Um, I, I, I could imagine that this would be a place where things could really sing for, for just the, the, the deviceless interface. Like if, if uh, essentially, you know, um, much like we have learned certain gestures operate our iPhones um, and you have to, there's a learning curve to get at them and, you know, to, you know, force touch when that was a thing or to hold touch or, or that kind of thing. I could totally see learning a few gestures to move yourself where it's like, maybe you, you grab a thing, you pull it out and then you push forward. And then based on how far you push forward is how fast you go. So then, then, then all of a sudden you're, um, you're, you, because, because it's the clumsiness of the, uh, jump forward, jump forward, jump forward, jump forward, herky jerk left, herky jerk left, herky jerk left, jump forward, jump forward, jump forward. That's a pain in the butt. And, and I, I, I feel like there might be a more analog feeling solution to that. I, you know, I, I'm sure there's like, and, and that's, it's interesting. It's like some of the people doing academic VR research, like locomotion is like a big area study. And if you're, like, you know, if you're somebody who's looking to get into like computer science, a young and very young audience with there in VR, like, like go read papers on that and you realize, oh, wow, you could, you could probably come up with areas to go explore in that field because it's an open problem. I'm wondering like, kind of more abstract, like literally shrinking in the space because that way, do we, let's, should we build interesting six by six spaces that feel expansive and big and whatnot? Or do we think about some sort of fourth dimensional form of travel? You know, some, and I don't know what that is, but some idea of like, you know, I, I know how to move from where I want to move to where, to get from point A to point B in some other way. And maybe it's like you said, some sort of gesture thing that feels intuitive or something, but just the idea of, I just, I look at that's one of the things that holds me back because you're in this environment, it's great. And it's like, okay, now I'm going to go here. I, I, you know, I, or, tele, or even just teleporting. Teleporting's smooth, but I'm like, why do I have to press a button? But also, but I think it's it's the aiming, the aiming and the triggering to teleporting that feels odd. That you're like, now yeah. I'm like kind of betting. It's it's really not, it's like throwing yourself, right? And you're kind of like betting on the arc being exactly right as opposed to just sort of moving to where you want. I think if that were frictionless, that would be ideal. And I, I, I could totally see like um, there maybe being a benefit to, maybe there is an outside and an inside. And inside is a bunch of, of, like you said, six by six cells that you, uh, conference rooms basically. And then uh, uh, they could all be beautifully themed and they could all look different ways, but, but essentially they're close. And then when you want to leave, you do a gesture of just making this up of just your, your, your arms go out and you, you flap hawa, once hawa, and then, and then, right. And then, then you, everything becomes just a bunch of cells in front of you and you could just point to one and go in another one, or you could just be outside, whatever outside means. Um, I, I, I think you're right. I think that, that there's something to the idea of intimacy of knowing that you are quote unquote alone in a room together, uh, as opposed to running around and, and that's one of the problems that we see with some of the vr chat programs is that you know there's always people running around asking if you know the way yeah yeah so it's good i think 
it's one of those things. It's just it's you, the, the difference between you watch those videos, like, oh, it feels cool. Would it be cool? Like, yeah, it'd be cool if we were in, you know, gymnasiums and could walk around as much as we wanted and explore. But when we're, you know, six by six foot spaces, uh, you know, we're, if we're going to do it from home, then we need to think. And then, you know, the other option, though, too, is like uh, once you go fully wireless. And I think the other part is like being able to. Uh, map your environment around. I think we've sh shown before some incredible. We've talked about this before, and I've I've done this. You've done demos of this when it was you know early stages. Is the a, the uh, VR that will convince you in a much larger space. You know, you start oh, walking right. where, and, where, where, where as you turn it overturns, so you don't really recognize that you're walking in circles across your room. That kind of yeah. Thing. You hop into an elevator, and then you know the next thing you know, you're on another floor, and you feel like you're on another floor. But it's just literally, you just yeah. walked into your corner, and you're now all right. Let's go. Right. So that'd be fun to see, and I think that's going to be what'll be really exciting now that we have a much more powerful wireless headset. I think we're going to get more developers excited to explore those kinds of things to think about like how how do you how do we make this even more realistic and it may not just be may not be a hardware problem it may just be a conceptual thing you know maybe. uh well i've got a conceptual thing for you do you like this show would you like to see it keep going well you can head on over to patreon.com slash weird things make sure that this uh, this year program continues rolling down the weird road. Uh, Patreon.com slash weird things is where you can get your custom RSS feed, get our after things podcast where we talk about all things entrepreneurship and stuff that's going on in our lives. It's right there for you. Patreon.com slash weird things. Yeah. Uh, I just want to answer a question just posed because some other people might be asking the same thing and somebody asked, why not just use a joystick to move? Um, in your VR set uh, controllers, you generally have thumbsticks, which you use to move. And the idea is to get away from that level of abstraction to something that feels more natural. So you feel like you're in the environment and not manipulating the character in the environment. Man, so. imagine, imagine if, uh, how about this? One of the things that um, you don't get with VR is the sensate part. Part of the reason it's creepy to move around in VR is because you, you, you see yourself moving but that's it. But if, 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 if we were doing kind of a flying thing, you know, you do a gesture and then you push your hand forward and then you start moving. I wonder if something as simple as like a, a set of fans that would blow air around you as you, you know, and the, and the faster you were going, mm -hmm. the, the more the air blew on you would give you that little visual cue that would allow you to feel like a, a, a physical presence there. Yeah, there was a, and there was a demo a while ago they did where you laid down and they had the fans blow at you like a flying simulator kind of thing, mm -hmm. which, you know, seemed to add to the intensity. Maybe, you know, it, I, you know, I don't I just wonder if it's just as simple as a little coding hack or something, because like, you know, an interesting thing in video games was, you know, our, our, our generation started with joysticks, you know, the big physical sticks. And then all of a sudden Nintendo came out with these dinky kind of controllers, but that became the norm. You know, the the you know, the controller today is buttons because it's just where the buttons are, what the buttons work. And, you know, you kind of reach this sort of the, the sort of high point of, let's say, like the Xbox controller. And for that kind of thing, it just works. And I think with VR, we're still trying to figure that out. Yeah. Gentlemen, uh, we've talked about this before, and I, I think it's interesting because it has a lot of potential of how we travel uh, via air. And that is... The Celera 500L, which is a company by Auto Aviation, which has been pretty secretive about this, but they've been working on an aircraft that is designed to be uh, ridiculously fuel efficient. This thing can go 450 miles an hour while only burning like one gallon for every 18 to 25 miles, which for an airplane is insane. What? And yeah, and like like that's like a 10x sort of improvement on what? planes can do and they say the operating cost of this thing is 328 dollars per hour which you throw the aircraft for something that can hold multiple passengers that's crazy so, so okay 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 so so obviously uh, there's environmental aspects to to this but i'm thinking immediately of the cost of air travel uh side of things where all of a sudden you could get anywhere like airlines operate on these razor thin margins, partly because 
just it's so expensive on the fuel side of things and so uh, when there's a winner it's usually because they've they've purchased uh, uh gasoline futures at a at a at a beneficial rate mm-hmm. that's that's how southwest did really really well in the early 2000s um but if you just didn't need that much fuel uh, uh, what's what's the secret to it is 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 like half helium or something hogwarts um so uh, just side note but like because air travel because nobody's flying they're actually blending aircraft fuel to use in ships right now like that's how like you know uh how impacted that industry has been but the secret is uh several things if you look at the body the fuselage of it it's a radically different sort of shape and design it's supposed to be extremely efficient they were early versions were using a diesel engine uh which i don't know if that's still the case for that which people are like diesel what that sounds crazy like ah, aircraft there's been a lot of lot a lot of things that always surprised me what, what's capable of that so it's got you know basically just a number of things from redesigned engine there's some sort of like like i think regenerative like systems they're using a lot of improvements that have existed elsewhere but as far as like how they've been put together um they say it's yeah they say one 500 horsepower diesel engine um, they've, the prototype's done 31 flights, and they say they expect FAA certification in 2023 with service in 2025. So, he, so. He, here's the other crazy part is uh, uh, the range is so much farther on it because it's so efficient. Then that means, uh, imagine, like, yeah, even if you're going slower than a commercial airliner at, you know, 550 or 600 miles or however many miles an hour, um, uh, you, you're skipping the whole hour long layovers and going straight to the place. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're in, you know, 460 miles an hour is, you know, for smaller aircraft, you know, or like uh charter stuff is fine. Um, you know, so, I mean, that, that's, you know, you're, you know, and like what we've known, we talk about, like we've flown on like jet X before and stuff. How, how just being able to show up 20 minutes before your plane leaves. <laughs> It's magical. Yeah. Magical. Oh, no, yeah. Just just uh, uh, huge. So I guess the question is, do they get into the world where they're selling these things, or are they going to run their own service and build their own fleet? I have a, I believe they're probably going to sell, um, and then basically, you know, I think that's going to be the somebody, best market. Somebody will base know? their airline on this. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you get the idea that, Part of the advantage of this is that there are way more airports than people realize. Um, most people realize that is, is that if you look at a map, you realize that like, oh, wow, there's a little executive airport here. There's an airport here. And you can't put 727s on those runways, but you can put much smaller craft. And a lot of that serves, you know, there there is an entire world of aviation outside of people getting on big jets, you know, from private aircraft, aircraft that serve, you know, functions for, you know, transporting documents, things like this, certain other kinds of flights and opening up those airfields to that's been a dream for decades of trying to come up, you know, fuel efficient aircraft that make it easier. So you could do, you know, smaller airlines and, you know, air taxi sort of service. So, so let's just assume that, that in general, uh, the, the nearest major airport is let's say a half hour to one and a half hours away from most people. Um, so you cut out, um, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 that goes down to 15 minutes. You're probably, most people are probably less than 15 to 20 minutes away from a small executive airfield. Um, mm-hmm. On top of that, you're also cutting out the transfer point in the middle. Um, the trade-off is you're going a little bit slower, but uh, man, I, I uh, like, like uh, th- this is some of the, uh, this is some of that alchemy stuff where it's just like, if effectively, like somehow going slower will make your trip faster or at least feel much, much faster. Yeah, you think about the, if it's $388 per flight hour and whatnot, and you're paying, you know, you put six passengers in there and you're paying, you know, two or $300 a piece or whatever. I mean, you, it's a viable business model there. You know, it's really, you, you figure out your, your fuel costs, your pilot costs, your ground support costs. And I think oh. that's, we may see, also, no TSA. I just realized as well because it would be it would be yeah. a private airline. Yeah, so you'd have whatever private sort of system they want. And so, yeah, I think that I I'm excited about this form of travel because I think that I don't 
travel as much as I do because I do not like airports. I do not like the hassle. That's that's the you know the bottom line is that there's few places that are worth getting to that are worth spending half a day going through that aggravation. Uh, were you know it as easy as is the times that I'm able to sp- you know fly on charter and fly on like you know uh, other kinds of flight like that, then I would do it. You know, were, were that more economically feasible for me, I would do that more often. I'm willing to pay more, you know, to do that. And I think a lot of us would be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a- a- any way that you can shake up that industry, I think it's uh, uh, going to be beneficial for everybody. And and part of it is also like, well, uh, we're at a point, we're at an inflection point for a lot of different things. And air travel is certainly among them to to ask like, okay, well, what's the norm, right? You know, the new uh, uh, United CEO just came in and said like, oh, by the way, uh, uh no more change fees. Like we're getting rid of them uh, uh, because they got to figure out what air travel is going forward. And I, I, I almost wish technology like this were, were a year closer to being uh, viable or getting FAA certi- uh, certified because I kind of feel like, well, you know, six people instead of, you know, a uh, uh, hundred, like, yeah, that, that might meet the moment. There's, you know, something we've talked about this before, but I don't think we've had this conversation kind of the context where we are now. And that one of the things that we often, when you think about travel in the future, we usually think about, you know, rockets, you know, things like this, you know, SpaceX or et cetera. We often think about maybe fancier looking airplanes, but moving to, you know, a model where you have, you know, we've seen Uber seems pretty, Uber's shift has been kind of a bit from the self driving car to more like, no, yeah, no, we want to have, you know, flying cars that take you from city centers to outer limits, et cetera, because, you know, that's, you know, the, the you know, the tragic accident with Kobe, Law, Kobe Bryant and everybody else on that helicopter flight, you know, uh, his daughter and the rest of the passengers in there, you know, kind of illustrated this thing that a lot of people weren't aware of was like, how many times a helicopter flies overhead and it's somebody who can afford that means to travel, you know, it's yeah. not just somebody doing important helicopter stuff. No, it's it's a form of travel that's used to get from point A to point B. But a trend is often what the rich people are doing now, 20 to 30 years from now, everybody's going to do. You know, we used to laugh at those rich people with their car phones. You know, look at those jerks with their, yeah. their brick phones, those Gordon geckos and stuff. Well, now we all have them. And the same thing applies to travel. And so it is a very interesting thing to think about. Like, if... For longer distance travel, if it's got if if we don't have to travel because we're used to working from home, then you got to make it better. Yeah, and maybe we're willing to pay more. Yeah, well, well, especially if, I mean that gets easier to deal with if you're doing it less. You know, it's like um, yeah, uh, uh, when 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 I was on tour, uh, it was just the cost of doing business, and and if I was going to make money on this magic show, it, I had to fly at the lowest rate possible, and that meant flying a lot of uh, crummy airlines and having miserable experiences. And but but there, I mean, there was no way to do a magic show without showing up, and now uh, now we got all these people who are doing exactly that. Yeah, and you you could think too about a model where. One of the things that happened, which was interesting, was, uh, you know, a lot of people who like they who own jets, they actually own, you know, fractional jet ownership. You know, the idea is that if you want to, if you want to, if you're a fancy person and you want to travel as a fancy person does, then you want to have your own airplane. But you don't really want to own an airplane because owning an airplane means you have to figure out, like, you have to have a pilot, you have to have a hangar, you have to have all these other things. And fractional uh, jet ownership came along, which was basically you pay thirty thousand dollars a month or something like this and you're guaranteed you know 30 hours of flight time per month or something like that which right. meant that you just say uh yeah and you could have a certain amount of availability window you could say oh, i just need to be able to have this in the next couple hours or tomorrow or whatever which was a way to sort of basically because they figured out like man most of these people have jets they sit idle they're not being used and so if you say okay we can have 10 jets service you know 80 clients then they save we make a profit off of the fact that we have that availability. You start extending that model into like when you say, you know, Brian, like I need to, I need to get from Austin to Los Angeles to come hang out with my buddy, Andrew. I just need I want a guaranteed ticket from here to there. It just, and with some, a carrier or whoever meets the minimum 
star rating that I want. All I care is that when I show up at the little airport, you know, on Friday at 2 p.m., something is there. Yeah. Waiting to take me yeah. there. And that gets to be an interesting sort of way of saying, like, yeah, like buying travel, not buying airlines, not buying, you know, anything else. Yeah, the uh, most of the options, let, let's take get Austin to LA as an example. Most of the options are going to be six to seven hour journeys because they'll, you'll have to stop in Phoenix or, or Las Vegas or something like that. Plus, you'll have, let's say, conservatively an hour long TSA. You have to get there beforehand. Uh, then you got to wait for your luggage. Call that a half an hour afterwards. So May, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to say it's like a seven and a half experience. If you're very, very lucky, you get a direct flight, and that's three and a half hours plus the, the TSA and the luggage experience. So that makes it, what, five hours. Um, you can go a lot slower and have a lot more comfortable experience for, uh, for a little bit more money if you just went straight point to point. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that... That's going to be an interesting thing is rethinking the entire travel grid from autonomous driving, which again, it's going to take a while. There's the edge cases are hard, but also, you know, flying cars, et cetera. And just, you know, you guys watch Westworld season three. Yep. Part of what I love though, was like kind of the flying car kind of thing. You just walked up, hopped into this thing. It took you off, whisked you away to wherever you needed to be. And then you were somewhere else, you know, that, that, that vision of the thing of, you know, just transportation becoming a thing you don't even think about. You know, you just say, I got to get from here to there. And something says, oh, go hop into this thing. I'm in this thing. You're like, and I want private. I want private. I'm a fancy person. I want to be private all the way. No problem. And right. then boom, from here to here to here. Well, and, and then once yeah. you really start thinking about that stuff, um, then you start to say, well, how much do I even care about taking my bags with me? If, you know, if, if a company knows my measurements and I know that it will have clothing of a style that I like and, uh, 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 you know, deodorants of, of my favorite, you know, preferences or whatever. Uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just hop into a thing and my body will, will be there. And, you know, some yeah. version of clothing that I like will, that, that'll be clean. will be ready to go. Yeah. Is there a target near my hotel? That's all I need to know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but if you like, uh, but I don't even care if it's used clothing. I mean, I buy stuff from thrift stores all the time. So it's like, as long as it's clean, and and matches you know a fashion sensibility that that that, well, that I like. Whatever. Welcome to dude travel talk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. Whatever. Overalls. I, it's fine by me. <laughs> I wash my hair with bar soap. <laughs> yeah. I do. Uh, yeah. I I do think there. Yeah. There is something to the fact that like I'm I am lazy. You know the point that like I think almost all all, all my clothes come from Amazon. And I could certainly see, like, I could just, just show up at a hotel and open up a cardboard box. And it's, yes, it's my wardrobe and everything I use. And then I'm done. I close it into the box. Don't know what happens to it. Don't, Don't care. care. You, you hop onto the thing yeah. and off you go again. It, it'll still be cheaper than the Pepsi from the uh, hotel mini bar. Yeah. And tastes yeah. better. <laughs> tastes better. Uh, uh, you guys want to jump into picks? Yeah, man. Sure. Uh, I saw... A sprawling time travel odyssey over this last weekend. Uh huh. Bill and Ted faced the music. Mm hmm. I liked it. Cool. I want to uh, see that. I'm looking forward to it. It was. It was exactly what I. It's exactly what you expect. It's exactly what I expected. I had a really good time. Uh, there was a couple of clever things that they did. It was fun. Cool. Yeah, I think it's just charming, you know. You just get to like you get get these uh, these great, you know, your your face hurts from smiling kind of moments, uh, which is I think ultimately what that series has kind of delivered uh, consistently. Uh, they also deliver a new type of character that I don't think I've ever seen anywhere else uh, in in the form of uh, uh, Justin probably knows who i'm talking about uh, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It, no they i, I, I mean, liked him quite a bit i think that that's another hallmark of the series it's just these great against type characters um and uh uh you know that continues cool. uh all right my pick uh i like love country I, I, 
like I don't know. Where do we do we want to talk? Did you guys watch the Val? Are are we here for Val chat? Or uh, I, I tried I'm, to watch I'm in. the I, latest I, I, episode. I, uh, I <laughs> boy, latest episode. Uh, yeah, let's talk. Let's talk about the Val. I I'm just really glad that NXV I or, or NXIVM is the Roman numeral a uh, 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 number to signify how many episodes are unnecessary in this season. Because <laughs> uh, good God, could they cut this thing down? Like between the episode before this, this episode, and then what they tease in the episode that's happening next week. Boy, is that one story. Would that be a, a good hour? I actually... Will, will, will you forgive me? Like, I watched it, and for the life of me, I don't think if there was money on the table, I would be able to remember what last night's episode was about. So things, things that happened. Uh, number one, I think one of the most legitimate criticisms of the series, for which Andrew uh, has brought up, and, and I certainly second, the idea that, like, hey, let's not pretend that all the negative press about uh, Nixium popped up in like 2017. Uh, uh, this is something that had been around for a while. They, they go into that. Uh, I don't know if it's quite a reckoning for our protagonists in the way that maybe it would be if uh, uh, things were, 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 you know, being done another different way. But like beyond that, it's just, there's good stuff. They always have a little nugget of a thing that's like, oh, wh have you ever wondered what happens when the Dalai Lama meets a near dwell? Here you go. Like we see video from inside uh, uh, this uh, conversation. But man, would that also be better in an episode that moved? And boy, howdy, is there just yet more keeping up with the Kardashian style recreations of things that like you don't really even get the sense of like when you are in time, because the last time we left these characters, our Vancouver lady was in LA with this family. And then we don't know. Like, was it a week? Has it been two weeks? Why is she back in Vancouver? Like either we're going to create urgency here as you're trying to pretend that this is all contemporary or you're not. Uh, but boy, I believe, I believe the whole, I believe the whole Dalai Lama arc was, we found out we were going to get the Dalai Lama, but then we almost didn't get the Dalai Lama, but then we got the Dalai Lama. <laughs> like, like that, that was the story. That was, what? that no, was 15 yeah. minutes of the episode. No, well, well, they're like, the Dalai Lama is going to come to Albany. And then they're like, and then somebody amongst his holiness Googles. And they're like, whoa, oh my God, have you read about this guy? This guy is awful. And they're like, no, absolutely not. I don't care. No. Hey, uh, are you awful? No, I'm not Well, no, awful. no, no. Then, then they're like, oh, well, he's going to fly to Tibet or wherever the Dalai Lama lives uh, or in India. And he's like, uh, oh, okay. Well, the, he showed up and the Dalai Lama's like, I don't know. It seems like you're awful. And he's like, Pfft all lies dolly and he's like for real and he's like bro and they're like i mean people tell lies about me ah, ah, ah. let's get back on the flight and leave and it's like there's an element of that that's like really funny but it's like but at, at the end of the day the more interesting version of this story is looking at things in a way different way and there's like there are elements of this that are just startlingly tone deaf like all of our main characters are just driving around in luxury vehicles. Like they're just, they're all in Benzes and BMWs. Oh, Malibu, and Malibu home, yeah. homes in Malibu. Yeah. yeah. Malibu homes. So, and it's like, they're all just like, oh, I'm so sad. I'm very sad right now. Oh. Can I give you like my, oh. my take on it? I, I sort of, sort of summarize this in a tweet. Cause like I've been following the story for years, right. Of next yeah. year. Fascinated by Colts for purely, you know, research purposes. And, and it really kicked me like, this is for me, anybody who's followed the story for a while, it's like you're watching like, oh, you got to check out this, 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 this HBO show. You know, what's it about? Oh, it's about this woman who begins to suspect her husband has a dark side. Oh, cool. And you watch this thing. It's like, yeah, 
you know, his letters to me, things like this, I'm beginning to realize that, yeah, there may be some darker side to him and I maybe I need to get out of a relationship. Well, well what's his name? Oh, uh, Ted Bundy. He's my prison pen pal. <laughs> like, oh, wait, like, like, wait. So this relationship started after he was in jail for doing this. And then you realized he maybe had a dark and that was like this. It's like, like. Google this dude. If you Google this dude years ago, you would see before this, we begin to suspect it's out there. It was out there. It's like, yeah, I'm beginning to suspect this cult leader with allegations of child abuse, uh, manipulation, extortion, fraud might have a dark side. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and they just, they just blast by these things where it's just like, oh yeah. What are the accusations was that he uh, molested or like had like, you know, statutory raped uh, uh, this girl that was a part of it. Uh, moving on. Uh, turns out the New York times wants to do a story and it's like, <laughs> well, look, they can only I'm do here. It if we all pinky promise at the same time, which look, there's another version. I don't know if this is the story that you want to tell with it. This is like a half episodes thing where you tell the entire version of what it's like to put together a story like this. I do think that there is a very real element of like, okay, for these stories, do you go on the record? Do you not go on the record? I think that there's compelling reasons that you can debate whether or not the story will run, the consequences for it. Like, I think that's interesting. Good God, it does not need to be an episode and a half, which is apparently what they what they're going to do, because surprise at the end, the big hook is like, we interview the New York Times reporter. Ooh. Ooh. Come Media back shy next. Reporter. Yeah, <laughs> I, exactly. Come back next week. I, I think I'm a little bit more forgiving of this aspect of everything in that I'm the target demographic and that I am totally ignorant of the full story. This was all news to me. I, I, I didn't read the articles about it. I didn't know about it. I only knew that you guys knew about it by osmosis. Um, and even in that position, I, I agree with your criticisms. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, yeah, I, it's no, not... I mean yeah, it's not the way in which you want to tell. It. It's just we're we're given a narrative that I'm having trouble understanding that that just does not reconcile with my understanding of the facts and points of views of characters. They're like, wait, this was known here, and you're you haven't addressed this. Like, like, like it's this made this like, I don't know, Ted Bundy, <laughs> you know, like it's you know, it's like, um, you're like, wait, like, didn't how are we why are we not talking about this? And it's like, oh, I mean, because we, we of get, the documentary we get series. No, I mean, we get some of that in this episode. Like, you, you okay. at least get questions to the main people on, like, cool. why did you ignore so much bad press? And you get the standard cult answer of, uh, well, you know, we just assumed that these people were out to get us, and there was always a reason why, and he always had an answer, and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Now, I think in another version of this documentary... I don't know if he would be taken at his word there. I think there would yeah. probably be an uncomfortable moment where they are asked repeatedly, but why, but why, but why? And they would have to squirm a little bit more. But at least it is like out there that beyond the Frank report, which like is another a, a pivot point on why they're innocent because they're like, oh, it's only this blog that's writing about it. They at least refer to hey there was a gigantic series by the times union there was a a a, a lot of other uh, information out there and and they called him a cult leader they called him a molester they called him an abuser so it's like you you do have to at least on some level answer for it in this episode but even then it's like okay well where do we go from here and also I found this out. This some bitch is nine episodes. We're just over the halfway mark of this story. And I'm like, I think there's a lot here, but good God, does it not need to be nine episodes? It could have been a killer five episodes. Yeah. Yeah. I gotta I gotta make it through because that we talked that before, because you'd asked me, would I be more forgiving if they kind of reconciled that they brought up that question of like were they confronted with what was known before? So I need to finish, but oh man, like I could I'm like five minutes in and the reenactment stuff that's not acknowledged reenactment they, was driving no, 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 me no. nuts. They, they at least acknowledge they like very briefly they have the word reenactment in there. No uh, the, on 
on this one. On one thing. Right. On one thing that isn't them acting. It's it's another thing of women talking about things that have happened in the cult and they just have voice actors, but they didn't have a a, a reenactment thing when they literally had a woman that was voice acted and body acted by somebody else before. I I was was dialed in a little bit more and I believe this episode, as bad as it is on the reenactment and the timeline stuff, might be the most precise they've been yet, <laughs> which is horrifying <laughs> because I saw like five dates given and the word reenactment once. <laughs> yes, exactly. And better than they've done the entire series beforehand. Yeah, and a lot of it's like, yo, this is 10 years. Like when they're talking about all of the previous, like the Times Union articles and everything, like they're talking about 03, 04, 05, 06, like, uh so yeah it's an interesting series i think that there is a very compelling story there uh but good we're, god we're not we're not going to be able to stop watching are we we're, we're gonna no <laughs> no no now it's to a point where i have to keep watching it now because i i i i'm at i'm rooting for keith ranieri to win <laughs> god yeah uh in our chat somebody says all i know is uh la sex cult and superman actress so uh, Albany, New York, Vancouver, yeah. um, there, and uh, Sex Cult, well, not all of it. And then, um, yeah, the uh, Smallville actress. Yeah. And then who? Yeah. Who, no, oh, here's, here's, also, yeah. also half the cast of Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. Here's, yeah. here's what I've learned. Like, if you like The Expanse, just write the actors a, a note on Twitter. Just, I like you, and you're worth it. And please, <laughs> just... Man, it seems like all these sci-fi actors that were shooting in Vancouver had some had some self-esteem problems that they all just got hoovered up into into this funnel. You don't need to seek validation from anyone but me. <laughs> You're great. I just apropos of nothing, the universe believes you to be great. Uh, Bryce, you have a pick? Uh, I do have a pick. I uh, uh, this came out a few weeks ago, and I finally got a chance to dive into it. I did not have. Uh, let's say the same exposure to this that a lot of other people did, um, but I'm I'm really enjoying it, and I'm told it's a very faithful recreation. Uh, it is the new Tony Hawk's Pro Skater One Plus Two. They went and they uh, remade those games, oh. and they put them in one package, and it's pretty good. It is really good. Um, you look at Tony Hawk's Pro Skater Five, which came out a couple years ago, and that game sunk on ice. Uh, it took forever to load. The physics were bad. It had this forced online lobby system for everything. This has got none of that. This is uh, Vicarious Visions, who made the Crash Bandicoot remake last year or the year before, which was also really, really good. Um, I, I'm really digging this. It's easy to jump in. It's it's It, it loads really quick Like because there's a lot of like, oh, I messed this up. I'm going to restart. Uh, that's That doesn't take forever. Uh, so they've remade all of the levels. They've got all of the new, all of the skaters plus new skaters. They've got all the tricks. Um, I think the only like big fundamental difference between these is um, the Tony Hawk Skater 1 levels. Uh, you can also do the manuals and the reverts. So all the stuff where you could chain your combos on the ground from mm. that they added to Tony Hawk 2 is uh, also available in Tony Hawk 1, which makes some of those levels a little easier. Uh, but I, I really dig it. And it's $40, which is like a really good price for both of those games. They've uh, added a lot of um, challenges into the game so hey as tony hawk do all of tony hawk specials uh, get these stat boosts get a medal in the competitions you know um so those are meant to add in extra longevity there's online multiplayer there's a, a an interesting speed run mode now so when you complete all of the goals in a level instead of starting a two minute timer counting down it starts a stopwatch counting up and it sees how long you it takes you to finish all of the goals in that level um, as fast as you can, which is fun. It's like there are a lot of like little bits like that that make it feel very modern, uh, and and I I really dig it. I am also not very good at this game. A lot of people are very good at Tony Hawk. I am all right at it. Man, I would love it if they did this for the original SSX. I would play the hell out of that. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, it's. I got a pick. Yeah, go oh. ahead. Oh, uh, my pick is Raised by Wolves. Oh, you, how are you liking that? I'm enjoying the heck out of it. Anybody else watching this? Mm-mm. No, but I've heard it's good. That's on Peacock, right? 
No, no, Bryce. It is not on Peacock. It is on HBO Max. Oh, I okay? see. Okay, because there's nothing on Peacock right now. Nothing. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe there is. Maybe there's a lot of great stuff. <laughs> Raised by Wolves is a science fiction series uh, produced, and the first several episodes are directed by Ridley Scott. And oh, wow. How he, do I not know about this? I thought you knew. I just assumed. And the premise, if you, it's one of those, if you watch the trailer, you think, oh, it's about this. It's not. And it's, it's based, I mean, it's part, it's this, there's this, conflict where eventually there's a new planet and the first people we send to colonize it or first pe- first first ones to get sent to colonize it is a um, man and woman android and six embryos that they raise as these children and then the conflict starts to happen because they're fleeing a war on earth and then the other side shows up and uh i do not want to spoil anything about this so I would just say that, like, uh, uh, I will. I am going to do mild, mild, mild spoilers. So close your ears. It's just, it's, a, it's just, just a, a, if you watch the trailers, but it's just a first act, you know, like first episode sort of thing. I'm like, I was into it, and then when the space crusaders showed up, I was really, really into it. You know, when the religious zealots showed up dressed like you know space crusaders, I'm like. Oh, now I'm into this. Wow. Right so, on. No, that sounds awesome. I'm told it's very Ridley Scott. Yeah, but it and and good Ridley Scott. Like mm-hmm. this is to me is like Ridley Scott on a canvas of television exploring a lot of themes and stuff. And that's like that's where the world just opened up for me because it becomes about different viewpoints and different factions and stuff, survival, etc. I I've really I think it's my favorite thing Ridley Scott's done in a while. And I'm not, wow. I don't want to oversell it, but it, it's it's weird. It's it's good weird sci-fi because you watch the trailer and it feels like a, just like a sci-fi channel movie of like, oh, these robots on a planet trying to kill a person. It's like it's deeper. Cool. Very awesome. Cool. So yeah. Raised by Wolves, HBO Max. Check it out. I would love to talk about it with other people. And again, like I said, it's just it's just not because I, I, I talk because I turned to my girlfriend and watched it. I like this because it's not like anything else. Yeah. All right, gentlemen. It's been weird. Mm-hmm. Hey, so, there we go. He's calling. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. That's all right. Yerby. Uh, all right, yeah. Uh, guys, go take a break. We'll come back in a few minutes with After Things. Hey, Justin. Yo. You have a good weekend? Uh, yeah, man. Uh... I'm uh, wrapping up stuff for um, Raise the Dead. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, lock that'll all get locked down this week so it can launch in two Soon. weeks. <laughs> Soon. Sooner than I want. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Oh, wait. I, I did want to tell you, I did listen to uh, to the raise the dead episodes and i didn't tell you about it because i had no notes they it really does sound fantastic and i don't know the genre well enough to know what is and isn't norms there but i i really yeah. did enjoy it and i think it's really really well made uh awesome yeah no that uh uh i'm hoping that your feedback has been by and large the the similar to what I've gotten with like a few little things here and there. Yeah. Um, but uh, I hope that that translates into people really, really liking it uh, and not like, oh, everyone missed. I lulled everybody into a false sense of security and then I, <laughs> no. and then I, then I really <laughs> screwed something up. Um, but um. Yeah, no, I'm 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 excited and uh did a uh a little bonus thing for the audiobook and that's really the big thing is just getting the audiobook uploaded uh um oh uh was there is there any updates on uh the thing that you were tweeting over the weekend? Yeah. Oh really? Yeah. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Uh no, I bought a car. Wow. Actually, and I bought a car. I'm surprised. Yeah. O- only, I mean, not, you seem you seem to have been content without a car. 
Uh, we were. Really, the biggest thing is, um, the, the big animating thing is that, uh, you know, these wildfires are bad and they're not going to get better. Like, right. technically, October begins fire season in the Bay Area and, uh, it is not something that Ashley can, like, live in. Like, she, like, is really, really, really sensitive to it and so... Um, a car gives us uh, the ability to even just bail, uh, evacuate for the weekend. Oh, like sure. even you know, beyond like, I don't think we're not in any danger of like the fires, like you know, burning our neighborhood or anything like that. But uh, when when these things last for a week and a half, you know, even if it's just us getting out of out of the the, the direct line and, and going somewhere else and it's not that that was impossible before we could rent a car we could go get it like it's just one of those things where it's it's one more level and it was it was mm -hmm. probably about time for us to um to to to, to get something and yeah yeah and yeah, and with you, you know what, california what No, oh no, no, sorry. No, wait, what were you saying? No, I was waiting I for you to, to talk. Okay, he's muted. Oh, he's no, <laughs> you're talking, you're talking, you scoundrel. Because um, you own a car too, and you're in LA, right, Andrew? Well, I guess LA is a very car city. Yeah, you need a car in LA. Wait, I wasn't muted the whole time. That's hilarious. Made a trip no. to the restroom, but the microphone's here. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'm like that panic. Oh, no. Um, no, I was just say that, like, yeah, with California, like, threatening to ban Uber and Lyft at any moment, that if you're a person that says, ah, like, you know, because all next thing you know, that happens. Can't get a zip car because everybody's going to be using zip and whatever. So, it's, yeah. it's, it's frustrating, like, that impact of, you know. I, I think also there's an element to this pandemic that has highlighted the uh, rugged individualism element of everybody. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, the, it's like the ability to. Yeah. So the GTFO. That's right. Yeah. So, and, and I think it's mm -hmm. like, so what we got was something that, uh, you know, we can go on a road trip in. Like yeah. we're not going to get, you know. So are you going to reveal it? Are you going to talk? Are you going to show it off? Is it a Twitter thing? Is it a stream thing? Is it? I don't know. I don't know when we want to do it. It is very funny. Um, yeah, you were saying it was a joke. It is a joke. Well, it was a joke that I was totally unconnected from this. Um, you know, there was this viral tweet going around of everybody, like the genre of people yelling in their cars about politics. Um, and they put like nine of them and they're all yelling and screaming together. And it just, it's like a cacophony of, uh, horrendous awfulness. And so I had tweeted that and just was like, Hey, uh, maybe like I'm dead inside because I don't have a car. Like these people are living, man. Like they have, they are riding the wave. Uh, I, and then we wound up buying a car. So it's like on, on one hand, like this is. A lot of this was long term kind of thought that wound up coming up to a head after I made a joke about how I should own a car. And at one point when we were buying it, the guy was like, so what are you looking for? Like, you know, stability, commute, you know, going out on vacations. And I'm like, well, you know, there's a not insignificant portion that has us in your office right now because it's a funny joke on the Internet. So, like, let's let's also understand that. <laughs> Uh, that was definitely that was not a that was not a a, a joke. I definitely said that to the car guy. Well, I'm, um, exci I'm excited to find out what it might be. I'm I'm hoping for a Pontiac Aztec. You found one. <laughs> an Aztec would be great. Oh my god, no! An Aztec would be would be would be amazing. Uh, Justin, do you need to uh, get a uh, take a break? No, I'm fine. You're good. All right, we got about uh, 35 minutes or so for for after things here. How are we feeling, everybody? Feeling ready to do after things? Ready to rock. Let's do Yay. it. All right. Then I'll catch you in for after things in three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. 
Mr. Brian Brushwood. Yo. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, that's me. So we didn't talk about this in the last episode, but I, I don't think we did. Did we we didn't talk about fundo.town, the new Google initiative the allow oh, you to like I, I don't think so. No, we didn't. No? Okay. Amazing name, by the way. You know, fundo.town. It, it's from a Google like labs incubator, which uh Google basically fundo.pizza, I'm sure is amazing, but fundo.town is where it's at. What this is, it's a service where you say, hey, I want to put on an event a week from today, like next Saturday at 2 p.m. I'm going to be talking about uh, the inside story on Justin and Brian, the real dirt, and then saving the special stuff about price. <laughs> and what it will be is all you have to do is you go there and I'm going to charge tickets, 30 bucks a piece. 30 people can sign up max. It's a system where you can put on an event. They handle the ticketing for it. So like they'll handle the ticketing for it. So people go there, pay for tickets. They keep 20%. Once it's time to do the event, you use their kind of their version of whatever video Google Hangout streaming sort of thing. And you have control over what you can do, who can participate, et cetera. You can do presentations at that, whatever. They'll do like, I think they'll do calendar reminders, et cetera. So it's a full self-contained system for putting on workshops, live events, et cetera. All you have to do is schedule an event when it's going to be, and then tell people this is where to go buy tickets. So and you can do, and, 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 and even the performance itself is self-contained inside of Fundo. Yeah, it's all handled from there, and you can do one-to-one -one chat. So you can just say, "Hey, if you want to go, you know, talk to me for twenty minutes or whatever, sign up to go do it." Part of it's aimed at like influencers as a way to sort of capitalize on you know, the audience like, oh, you know, pay 50 bucks and we can take a virtual selfie together and you can say that you met me or whatever, but also you can do your own workshops and classes. Huh. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I think that the versions of this idea have kind of been around for a while, but like a lot of stuff, I, I, I think that there's just a different, fundamentally different way that A, we're looking at it, B, we're looking at what the audience is and, and, and C, you're kind of seeing where the best rounded edges can be kind of shaved off because, you know, cameo was something that I didn't think was going to take off on the level that it did. And that was pre pandemic. Now that there's no live events, the idea of like virtualized meet and greets are something that I think are like legit and, and, you know, be it something like that or, uh, well, I mean, if you're going to do a platform like Fundo is, the idea that they are being the one-stop shop for all that, for like, here, do your workshops, here, do your live Q&As, here, do your virtualized meet and groups is is smart. I, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting because the market to me is open to find a leader for something like that. They're looking to kind of mint a brand name if somebody can really nail it. So well, uh, and, and for and audience, do, these all stay behind just, a paywall on like Cameo, like yes, because they, uh, uh, that that was my biggest beef with Cameo is just that, you know, uh, every one sided um, awkward meet and greet was just you know flash frozen for for everyone to see forever. Well, I think, can I clarify yeah, who, for people who don't know what Cameo? Let's wait, wait, wait. Let's back up. Let's explain what Cameo is to people who don't know. So Cameo is a service where yeah. you could basically pay for like a celebrity or somebody to like, you know, do a one-on-one -on -one with a, a thing or have them wish you something, have a celebrity like, you know, a wish you a happy message. birthday, do a personalized message. Yeah, that's what Cameo was. Um, yeah. So it was basically having them record a message. This is different. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the idea of like, we, I think we go from, all right, the best thing would be if I could meet my hero one-on-one, -on -one, right? And at a certain point, the idea of any kind of virtualized, oh, they send me a text. Well, it could be anybody. Or like they send me a picture. Oh, okay, well, they're, they're you know, mass producing this. But at a certain point, that became, as we interacted with each other more virtually, those became more personal because you had other versions of it. What Fundo, I think, kind of takes to the next level is the professionalism of it and uh, a, a platform that's literally built after we understood exactly what we wanted out of these services. And very often, I think that's that there, there really is an advantage to that. Yeah, and, and to clarify, like, so Cameo has, you can do a live, you can do a one-on-live live with a person, but it's like, 
it's done through Zoom, it's done through another platform. And and I think that, and you know, we may see them go into the the workshop and the class space, which I think is kind of the really interesting thing about Fundo. It's like you can bring 30 people into a thing and do a thing. Or, you know, Cameo is more like, how do we, how do you pay for like access to a famous person or whatever to get them to do a greeting or this, which felt a little weird to me. But then again, the people who line up at conventions to get autographs would say that my expectations and theirs are very different. Um, so that, but also like you're basically having to sort of loop through a couple other things to make it work. Where with Fundo, like again, for Fundo to me, the idea that it's like, do a class, do a workshop, teach a thing, you know, you have 30 people there, et cetera, and it's all on one platform. That is like, to me, that's just making it so much easier, the idea that all you have to do is just say, hey, show up here, you know, and, you know, buy your ticket, show up, and as a presenter, click this URL, and you can go do your thing. Now, do um, uh, you both are aware of the uh, the lecture industry in the world of magic where you know you you go around and you do maybe a, a two to three hour lecture where you uh, half of it is performance half of it is explanation but the real money is made when you sell lecture notes afterwards um and part of the reason that works is because um it's a slow burn city after city as you go to place to place um would would this be a good thing in that all of a sudden you could you could you could i guess if you limited the number of slots i i, I just wonder if you would burn out your audience faster and burn out your new material faster on it but you would make more money how, how, how do how do you think this virtualized experience could map onto that that structure you're only doing 30 people at a time. Remember that. You're only doing 30. Right. Okay. So and, and you can't do more than 30 on Fundo anything? Correct. Okay. Correct. Got and, it. And, and which the advantage is the idea is that you, and you should price accordingly. So if I was, if I wanted to go do magic lectures and I wanted to do them virtually, then I could go do set up like, hey, I'm doing a thing this Saturday. You know, it's, it's X amount of dollars to go hop into, you know, do this with a sizable email list. I might be finding out that I'm going to be doing this for the next 20 Saturdays, right? You know, because to 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 meet my imaginary demand, so I think that's part of it. Is like, yeah, it's going to be different people showing up each time because you're you're focusing on a smaller group and charging sort of a higher ticket. That's great because, like, uh, I think the default kind of thing that you're thinking, if if you're doing highly specialized stuff, I think I think um, uh, this goes back to uh, uh, I forget Rory's last name, uh, but but the book Alchemy, Sutherland, it, uh, Rory Sutherland uh, in his book Alchemy. Uh, he makes the counterintuitive point that a limitation can be the magic that makes something really work. And the on paper, it's like, why would you limit yourself to only 30 people? Uh, and the answer is, is because everybody coming knows that there's only 30 people there and they all feel special. And that's part of what they're paying for. So 30, you know, 30 people at, at uh, you know, 20 or $25 a piece, you know, that that seems like an impulse buy for somebody you care about. Um, uh, this is great. This is mm -hmm. a structure that's sorely needed right now that sort of replaces the local club experience for anyone from uh, whether you're doing magic, whether you're doing lectures, whether you're doing music, whether you're doing, you know, and, and on and on. Um, I, I, yeah, I really like this. So we have like in Magic, we've had like Penguin does Penguin Live, which I've done one of those, which is, you know, it's neat, but it's it's a one to everybody and then sell the video afterwards. Right. And I think that this is a different thing. And I, I uh, Brian, I humbly suggest, you know, scam stuff. Think about doing like who who are some of your the favorite people you've had do shows and say, hey, we're going to do a series on a Saturday. You can pay 30 bucks to spend an hour and a half with this person. You take a cut, you know, you know as a facilitator for it. And you know, never another revenue stream. Uh, yeah, no, I think I think that's a great idea. And in fact, it makes me, you know, uh, that's the other thing is if it's an ongoing workshop where it's like uh, you could, uh, let's say, on an ongoing basis, we wanted to create uh, a small club, you know, call it, uh, uh, you know, podcast club, where it's like every day where uh, uh, there's a lot of people out there. For example, the audience that listens to After Things who uh, are working on their own thing and we're going to get together for uh, an hour long workshop once a week, just a $20 each time 
Uh, you don't have to come every single week, but then they'll, they'll only be 30 allowed in at any single time. We're going to listen to your stuff. I'm going to give my thoughts and advice. And, you know, we, I mean, it, like after things could be one of these on an ongoing basis as an event based thing, rather than even as a podcast, not, not that I'm threatening to, to take us over there <laughs> to take away the podcast, uh, yeah. but, but, yeah. but, but in an alternate universe, I think the four of us know a thing or two about building a brand and podcasting or whatever. And, and I think we could do it as, as a ticketed event. Yeah. Somebody writes in the chat. It literally sounds like zoom plus event, bright. Yes. And that's why it's yeah. wonderful because instead of, oh, I got to go do this here. Now I got to figure out how to gate people. It's like, I, I don't, Speaking for myself, having tried to put together different solutions together, it is a huge pain point, and it's why things don't exist. There's a lot of things out there that don't exist because nobody bothered to put peanut butter jelly. Nobody bothered to take, well, this is simple, and this is simple. All you need to do is put those things together, Well, and you've got magic. Yeah, and the market's ready for it. You know, one thing that I think w has continued to fade away and will probably only continue to shrink further is even though we are all very online and we are all very, we have all put our credit cards into websites a, a dozens and dozens and dozens of times uh, every you know a year, there is a line that a lot of people have about even that simple idea that they that they don't want to share their credit card information. It's it's literally the the hurdle that both Apple and Amazon were able to cross. Uh, very early on was just like, oh, iTunes, a, so a dollar a song was enough for you to have an iTunes account. Uh, anything uh, to your doorstep within two days was enough to have an Amazon account. Uh, and, and now you can build a, a world off that. The barrier that I think the average person has for let me spend something, spend some money online. The idea that we have now virtualized silos that are more uh, approachable like cash app or venmo or i mean the same way that you know paypal was for a lot of us uh there's just more money online and people are more excited for it uh, and i don't know I, I i i'm bullish on stuff like this yeah and and I'll, I'll tell you what it reminds me of is um it seems like there are aspects of both what you were doing andrew with magic club with uh uh, uh, and Andrew gold, that's his name, right? Uh, Jordan gold, Jordan gold. Sorry. Uh, um, yeah. uh, and, and also, uh, the iTrix tiny chat hangout that you guys w were doing, um, only, only as a formalized thing that could actually be profitable. Uh, man, that's, that's fantastic stuff. This, uh, uh th this sounded very familiar to me when, when you brought this up, Andrew, because, uh, just a few weeks ago, Facebook unveiled a similar thing paid online events um mm -hmm. and this this was a big story in the tech community because facebook is uh waiving their fees for this and uh they uh wanted to put on the app uh have it say well apple is taking 30 percent of this payment um and that was its own kerfuffle with apple stuff but um that that also seems like an alternative to this which is like all in like they have a video streaming platform and a ticketing platform and it's hooked into all of the Facebook, you know, events and group stuff that, you know, a ton of people use. Uh, also, a friend of mine who works at Bandcamp, and they've done a few of these now, they're doing like Bandcamp uh, live events. So you can, if you're an artist, you can live stream an event, you can ticket it, you have a merch table right below the video. So if people want to buy a shirt or a disc or whatever, they have those options there too. Like virtual events are, are there, there's a lot of these coming out and right about now is, is when, you know, it seems like they're finishing their, de their dev cycles on that. Yeah. It'd be interesting. Yeah, it's going to be a very interesting space. What I liked about this was like the, the Facebook one to me looked one it's embedded in the platform. It looked a little more complicated to get it. And I, I was, I went through there looking kind of trying to go like, okay, I think I get how I'm supposed to do this and how I'm supposed to share this. And, and I'm sure it's great. I just, the, the Facebook God, maze always I sort hate, of drives me nuts. I hate it. I hate it. I don't know yeah. what the hell's going on. I don't know where I would watch it. I don't know where I would know that I had a ticket. Like it's just, it's very frustrating that Facebook just keeps adding another layer and another layer and another layer to this already incomprehensible concept. But, but at least they don't, 
insist on calling every goddamn thing Facebook. <laughs> Like, what? what is Facebook now? Is it the virtual reality place where your grandma hangs out and you go to music yeah. events? And, and I know when my friend's birthday is. And also, <laughs> it's the place where there's a group that I accidentally joined from a podcast I used to listen to. And that's 80% of my feed. And also my... My, but it's uh, also the place uncle... that, that unreliably sends you or chooses not to send you the content that you signed up for. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and also my uncle's fight, like, and uh, that's where that happens too. <laughs> also uh, racist uh, uh, screeds about Trump. <laughs> sure. And also yeah. the, the, the Facebook thing, I don't know if it limits the number of people because I'm looking at. No, um, I don't believe so. Because this and is... that's Timmy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, I say that was sort of kind of a bigger thing to me was just the idea of that. The 30 person limit, again, it'd be great to be able to set that stuff, but I, to me, that was like, it's, that's such an attractive feature. It is such Smart. an attractive feature, be, you know, because, yeah, so. Is that is that a yeah, hard I, limit? Because I'm looking at a what looks like a press release, and this just says, Fundo recommends not selling more than 30 tickets to an event. Oh, it might be. I think, yeah, I think that that's probably. It might be um, like the Kickstarter thing where they recommend you not go over 30 days, but there's probably an yeah. upper limit to there. That's that's a little higher than that. Huh. Yeah, but no, I think that's that's great. I think yeah, the idea to limit it, to whatever, I think is a really key thing. So, and I'm gonna throw out some ideas for. Uh, there might be people who are like, oh, sounds cool, but it's great if I, you know, was a podcaster or did something like this. Let's say you were a fan of, you know, well, let's do Star Trek as an example. Let's say you're a fan of Star Trek, okay, but you're not a name in the Star Trek world, because you've never run Star Trek, whatever. But you said, you know what? I, I know there's a community. I'm active on Reddit about this. You could go out to say, you know what? Maybe there's some people who've written some Star Trek books, you know, some of these Star Trek novels. Maybe I could get hold of them and say, hey, uh, let me get two or three people and do a thing in two weeks where meet the authors of these Star Trek novels, you know, virtually and talk to them about the storylines and whatever and charge 20 bucks and split it with the authors, you know, do a more involved, you could do mini cons, you know, every, you could do mini conventions, mini stuff. You can be an organizer. You can produce either off of your own reputation stuff, or you could produce off of being able to organize and put things together. I've tried to tell so many of my friends who are like trying to figure out who are involved in sort of entertainment stuff and do con stuff like now, like you're going to watch somebody who you've never heard of jump on board with this and start the next big fan, the next big fan business, whatever is going to be somebody using this platform or platform like this to start organizing stuff. Cause they're going to reach out to these actors and creatives and stuff who aren't working right now, but who have names and have been a part of big franchises that have so much value. That and is a brilliant observation. It's like, what is so great about the words uh, Comic-Con or Dragon Con or Gen Con or whatever? It's like, you could just organize that. If you could get, if you could get the original cast of, you know, the, the writers of the A-Team or whatever in the room, you, you could sell it as I a know one of them. event. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> but, but, but it's like, um, if people like the panel... They don't need to wait for a once a year opportunity to, you know, to, to stand in a line to, to, to miss the event. They, they, they could be there as yeah. an exclusive 30 person cabal. I, I have a friend who, who is a, a writer on that show and on another big franchise, big you know, geek franchise that this would be perfect for him. He's a great storyteller and he's, I'm going to go, you know, probably give him a call like, Hey, you should be looking at this because he does conventions, did that kind of stuff. That was part of what he did. And I could see, there's so much opportunity and also like there are people who are really who have names and involved with stuff they're not going to do it on their own like comic book illustrators and stuff you know you could yeah. say oh let me call up this illustrator and say would you want to do like a one-on-one -on -one sessions with people to give them points about their art or whatever like they do at comic book conventions you could set that up you could be the facilitator who sets that up a lot of those people the only reason they ever did those things was because that mechanism existed Somebody said, oh, yeah, just buy a booth at this convention or they bring you here and you go do it. They were never going to do that on their own. And we need people who organize and produce talent to help capitalize this and make this thing that happens. Like, I think there's so many there's so many creatives out there that are looking for things to do. But if somebody comes along and says, hey, let me help you organize this. Let me put this together. Uh, another niche that pops into my mind is um, master calligraphers will go town to town and uh, walk people through the proper techniques to do, you know, uh, uh, whatever their trick of calligraphy is. Uh, man, there's a ton of possibility here. 
yeah, there, everybody within the sound of our voices, if you're looking for something, this is a, not saying it's going to be fundo.town, but this is a, this is a Patreon moment. This is a YouTube moment. This is a moment where all of a sudden you take in a, a thing that people are passionate about in a way, in a business model and it's met and it's been extremely streamlined and made easy. And I, you know, mark my words, you know, <laughs> as long as Google doesn't shut it down 15 minutes from uh, now. Like they yeah, yeah. do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That ever happened. Email list, kids, get an email list, whoever you are. Like we, we, we talked a bit to, I don't know if we could name names. We had a friend of the show who did a niche podcast with the, you know, one of these, you know, genre franchises. And I talked to him once about advertising. He says, well, I'm too small to advertise. I'm like, well, how many of your friends have podcasts on the same topic? He's like, well, several. I'm like, well, why don't you loop them all in and sell yourself as a package to advertisers? And because, you know, your audience plus their audience plus a few other people, you've got a bigger audience. He did that. And he brought in a name brand advertiser to advertise on all their podcasts because you just have to think he had to just step up and say, oh, I've only got this, but five other people only have this. But we have this five together. That's valuable. Yeah. And it's just yeah. a lot of business opportunity is just alignment of resources and people are a resource. You align them in the right way and say, ah, I can make this thing happen now. Yeah. Fundo.town. Absolutely. Want to do picks? Uh, yeah. Uh, I got to pick uh, Lovecraft Country is good again. Uh, I, I've been kind of dialed out over the last few weeks. I, I, I've, I've gotten a little bit bored of the sort of long-term story they were telling. And then they told kind of a one-off episode that just brought me to tears today. It was, it was freaking great. It took place entirely uh, during the Korean war and uh, our main character uh, Atticus doesn't even show up until I think the last 20 minutes in, in there. Um, it's, it, it was very, very good. And it's caused me to realign my current opinion of Lovecraft country. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, double up on that. I've been a little bit more, uh, uh, bullish on, uh, Lovecraft country. And I thought it was, I thought it was a, a an effective episode there. Are, I got some, got a few quibbles, Maybe. but, uh, it was a little graphic. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't that, that I've come to expect and appreciate from them. Uh, and, uh it, things that, that I initially was like, really? But I really need to do more research uh, to to kind of I I I don't I don't know exactly. Was it about the behavior of certain military officials? No, it was about the idea of who exactly the good and bad guys are in in our in our story. But again, I don't know enough about the Korean War to yeah uh, to, to oh. get at, get into it. Interesting. Yeah, I've I've been digging Lovecraft Country uh, the whole way through. I did think this was a really a really cool episode, interesting to bring in and sort of acknowledge. Just oh yeah, there are like other forms of supernatural monsters in other parts of the world, other mythologies, and, and so the so that uh, it's it's weird. I I would like to it, it's it's a sort of thing where like okay, there's magic in this one little town and the town is secret and it keeps itself hidden and you have to, you know, wonk a, wonk a helicopter your way into it and no one else would <laughs> accidentally find it. But now is there a lot, is there a lot of magic out there? I don't know. Well, I, I, that's I, a I question think, I, think I have that's for where further. they're headed to uh, because I mean, even the poster sort of, um, and I, I've not read enough HP Lovecraft to speak with any authority on this, but even the poster references what looks to be, you know, uh, uh, the, one of the great old ones and, uh, you know, maybe some kind of Cthulhu-esque uh, imagery in the background uh, where I yeah. hope that the story just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more terrifying. Um, but, but yeah, I don't know. I, and I, I did think this recent episode was, uh, was, was nice. It was interesting to see them, you know, they, they have been making a lot of these parallels with various, um, forms of oppression. And so having this one pretty clearly tie into, to queer oppression, uh, was, uh, was really, uh, was really interesting, especially after But, but, but not last... in a clumsy way at all. I thought it was fair, fairly subtle in that, in that regard. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, I, do, have you thought some of them had oh, been clumsy I, I, before? I, yes, uh, yes. That's that's 
oh, why I almost wanted to tap out. It's like, it's like, we get it. It's, it was very difficult to be black in the fifties. It's uh, four okay. episodes of that, huh? You know, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, and, and a random monster each time. That's, that's, that's where I was headed towards. But, but in this case, I thought uh, I really liked the way they handled it on this one. Yeah. So I, I still stand by like, I, I got, I got, I'm not as far into as you guys. Like I want, Actually, I just want that show about how you're surviving in the 50s as a black yeah. person because that's that to me was like that's the scariest stuff so far. That's yeah. just just the uh, you know sundown town. What's this? You know, like <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, and I I grew up in Oregon, a state that was you know effectively a sundown state. Um, so uh, yeah, but yeah, I'm curious to see. I'm I'm nowhere near as far into it as you guys are. I'm curious to see kind of where it goes. Um. I, I, my pick is, I think I'm like late to this train, um, five episodes into it. So no spoilers, uh, the outsider. Oh, nice. Oh, wow. Yeah. How cool. I, yeah, I like, I'm I to me, it was like, I haven't finished season three of true detective. So I got, and I, I know that it's like to be exceptional, but I haven't, but to me, I'm like, man, it's like, it's like some said, you know, true detective is cool, but it could be weirder. <laughs> and then it's like, you know, like what if Stephen King gave us an idea for a true detective season? And that's what the outsider feels like. And uh, I've been enjoying it, really enjoying it. Uh, yeah, both both uh, season three of uh, True Detective and The Outsider, I thought were very, very good. Uh, congrats. I'm excited yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. At Ben Mendelsohn, I. Yeah. I understand the hype now. I understand why, you know, he all of a sudden there was a lot of attention on him as an actor and, you know, why he started getting bigger roles, you know, watching this was just, uh, you know, really just, uh, he's great in it. You know, he's just, just believable and great. So, um, good Chris, a good cast all around too, but as you can kind of figure out, there are some Stephen King sort of little tropes in there, but it works really well. Uh, the, uh, the researcher, her character's great. She's really well done. Um, all good. So, The Outsider. Gentlemen, it's been Fundo.town, thanks. <laughs> All righty, well, that'll do it for uh, Weird Things and After Things today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. The guys will be yeah. back in about 40 minutes with Happy Hour. We've got... Um, we've got Lamar Wilson on Cord Killers today. Oh, right on. He's always fun. Nice. Yeah. So, I'll be at 6 Central. Justin R. Young on Twitch. Andrew Main on yep. Twitter and Periscope. And all that good stuff. We guys have a good rest of your Monday. Yep. Say bye, Yay. everybody. Bye, guys. Bye.